Um, I'll keep an eye out. So Jonathan, when you um, kick it off, introduce counselor spot. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the attendees. Let's see if there are any other counselors we need to introduce at the top. I think we might have just gone live. I got a note. We did. Probably like that. Yeah. Which is great. Well, folks, uh, anyone that's in this early, uh, we're definitely going to wait until after 6 p.m. to truly start. So please hang tight. Thanks for the patience. Quite a few folks have just joined. We're still waiting till 6 p.m. to truly start the presentation. So please hang tight while others join. We've got to get about 70 attendees to join till we start. So we're gonna try and wait that out, um, get as close as we can to that. Thank you for the patience. Uh, Emerson, I don't know if um, Brad had a chance or, or Jonathan, Brad had a chance to reach out to you. He's not going to be able to make it tonight. So Sarah Lewis is going to handle his slide um, on McGrath. So I believe Sarah then hands it off to Dean Emerson for the pump station features. Okay, great. All right, so we are just about at 6 p.m. now. Um, I wanna give a few minutes to folks that are joining late. Uh, we wanna acknowledge that some folks will have to join by phone. So at this point, uh, it would be good to mention that this whole presentation will be recorded and posted to the Summer Voice site, um, which can be accessed after the fact. It will be uploaded um, probably within a week. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to the Poplar Street Pump Station and Art Farm Community Meeting. Uh, we wanted to meet with folks now that we've had a chance to digest some of the technical aspects of the design project that we're intending to see through. Um, so the first thing I wanted to highlight, I mentioned this already, that we have a project hub on the Summer Voice platform. So this webpage, um, we're gonna send this link out in the chat. This is going to be the hub for information on this project. We will be uh, posting this, this presentation. Uh, there's already a project summary here as it 
uh, exists at this point. Uh, we'll be posting surveys there, the presentation materials, the background information on the site, and contact information. And I will be the primary contact. My name is Jonathan Smith. I'm a project manager with the city of Somerville. Um, so the purpose of this meeting is to give an overview of the regional drainage issues, introduce the pump station project uh, in its scope, recap some of the art farm project process, um, and, and give some context to our design, gather the community ideas for expanded site elements beyond what we've shown in our renderings, and then target some future meetings for community involvement. So specific to this meeting, uh, we're gonna give a status update on Art Farm. We're gonna drill down into what the pump station is for. Uh, we'll, we'll delineate some of those features of the pump station. We'll show you some of the ideas we have to integrate within Art Farm. And we'll open up for a Q&A and we'll set up some next steps for future meetings. And I wanted to mention that interspersed within this presentation, we will have a couple of uh, live feedback sessions. So we're going to be using a platform. It would be good if you had a smartphone available in addition to the browser you're viewing this presentation from. If that's not available to you, please don't sweat it. We will definitely be able to post the polls uh, after the fact on the Summer Voice website. So we will definitely be able to get everyone's feedback on anything we're asking tonight or any of the presentation materials. It'll all be available. So um, if there's any sort of issues, we'll try and solve that um, live. We have some folks that are ready to respond to the chat. And also, if it just doesn't seem to work out, we'll definitely be able to get that feedback after the fact. So again, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm the project manager, specifically working on the uh, stormwater infrastructure design and definitely helping as we transition to uh, a single project approach here. Um, we have Rich Raish on the line, the Director of Infrastructure and Asset Management. Uh, we have Greg Jenkins, Executive Director of Somerville Arts Council, Luisa Oliveira, Director of Public Space and Urban Forestry, uh, Sarah Lewis, Director of Planning and Zoning, Brad Rawson, Director of Mobility, and from our consultant team, we have Emerson Olander, Liza Cohen, and Chris Bridal, and Eric Talender from the architecture firm. And from the art farm design team, Chris Grimley from Over Under and Will Martin from Groundview. So at this point, I'd like to hand off to Rich Raish to give you the bigger picture and to see where we're at at this point. Thank you, Emerson. I'd also like to point out that uh, Ward 2 Councilor JT Scott uh, is here in attendance. Um, and I'll see if there are any other councilors that join us uh, later on. Thank you, Councilor. Um, so we'll we'll start uh, taking a, a quick look back um, on what is the status of the Art Farm project. The last uh, update meeting that we had for Art Farm was back in September of 2019. Next slide, Jonathan. Um, at that point in time, most of the major elements of Art Farm and Art Barn had been established, and we reported out on that at that time. Uh, from that point, our intent was to um, finish the, the contract documents. And we also needed to update um, the design to integrate net zero readiness goals, uh, which had not yet been incorporated into the design. Um, we were in the midst of doing that uh, when COVID-19 hit. Um, and as we did with a large number of projects uh, in the city, we paused that design. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, there's uh, a lot of uncertainty a year ago in terms of uh, what continuing work looked like, what construction would look like. Um, and, and so we paused at that time. Now, there were some limitations uh, at that point in time because the pump station side of the, the site hadn't yet been really defined in terms of design details. So we had a bisected site at that point in time. Uh, Art Farm had been very well uh, established in terms of design. The pump station, not so much. So we're just gonna have a line down the middle of the site uh, and, and then try to integrate the two of them later. Um, and those were very large unknowns. You know, what, what would that integration look like? And also what were the impacts of, of phased construction? Uh, and those were things we were simply living with. 
Um, so the pump station design did proceed uh, during the, the pandemic, again, because it was a design effort and something that we could uh, continue remotely. So that's what we did. Um, and it now affords us the opportunity to really integrate the two projects. Uh, and I think in the long run, it's a, a much stronger overall project for, for being able to integrate it and deliver it as one unified site rather than a, an awkwardly phased construction. Next slide, please. Um, you know, the, these two projects have had a parallel history. Um, really, the, the history of the pump station starts as far back as 2013, when some general um, planning around what infrastructure to support Union Square looked like. Um, and it, it was uh, grandly conceived, uh, particularly as we move forward and were able to negotiate capacity with the MBTA uh, around the Green Line extension. Um, obviously, people in Ward 2 and, and in the city are well aware that we've been constructing what we uh, affectionately call SAUCY, the Central Ave Utility and Streetscape Improvement Project. Those have been going on uh, for, for a few years now, and that will integrate into the, the Poplar Street um, pump station. Uh, in parallel, you know, some of the Art Farm Focus Group started as far back as uh, 2014. Uh, we had a design team hired to help facilitate that uh, and really did a lot of uh, community engagement to determine what would go on uh, in, into the art farm project. Um, and again, that, that last community update we had in late 2019 uh, was, was the last major uh, update we had in terms of what uh, the content of art farm is. Next slide, please. So, you know, there, there are elements of the two projects that are compatible um, and uh, work well together. Um, art Farm had the Art Barn, uh, uh, which is a performance space, a shed, the plaza, the greenhouse, the, the green lab, the rain garden. Um, all of these things have been well established as, as programmatic elements for the Art Farm, really focused on an active community space. The, the pump station facility is, is a piece of infrastructure, you know, largely um, unobtrusive to, to the public, other than the fact that we need a building in which to, to house some of the equipment. But then everything, most of the, the heart of the pump station is all underground. Uh, and the art farm can be developed on top of that. Uh, and if you didn't know the tank was under there, uh, you wouldn't know the tank is under there. Next slide, please. So now that we've um, come to a point where we've advanced the pump station design, we've got this opportunity to unify these two projects. Um, and a lot of it will actually help with the, the art farm uh, concept or art farm uh, plaza design. A lot of the, the um, art farm elements were designed around existing grades and, and the fact that there used to be a transfer station here. Um, and, and the design team there did an excellent job of trying to integrate uh, those elements into the, uh, the landscape. But really that was in, in the guise of trying to keep the, the budget low. With the pump station, we have to do mass excavation uh, and build a very large tank, uh, as, as we'll discuss a little bit later. So that gives us an opportunity to remove the contaminated soils and regrade the site uh, into a, a more deliberate way rather than a reactive way to, to the existing um, uh, site features. Next slide. So, you know, what is the pump station for and why is 10 Poplar Street so important? So I have to start with a brief history of water. Well, maybe not of all water, but at least why Ward 2 floods uh, and why raw sewage sometimes discharges to the Charles River and Mystic River when it rains. Um, Going back to the history of Somerville uh, up to 1852, Miller's River sn snaked through uh, a good portion of, of uh, southern Somerville and uh, East Cambridge. In fact, most of uh, Union Square was Miller's River, uh, and, and a lot of the Interbelt area was uh, Miller's River, Miller's Pond, and, and a lot of swampy areas. Um, this was a, a public health nuisance um, uh, for, for the area, particularly as Somerville started to grow, 
and combined sewer and drainage systems were put into the populated areas that drained down to Miller's River. So it was essentially a, an open cesspool uh, that was a, a, a health concern. Uh, so through the late 1800s, 1873 to 1879, began programmatic effort to fill Miller's River because it was really seen as a public health hazard. Uh, and, and as that Miller's River area got filled in and then developed on top, the, um, the pipe network in the area expanded. Um, the, there was a metropolitan sewer uh, through the area that serves both Cambridge and Somerville that uh, discharges stormwater and sewage at that time out to Boston Harbor. Um, there was also an overflow pipe from that uh, big sewer that ran down what is modern day McGrath Highway that was shared by Cambridge and Somerville that took some overflows to the Charles. In that same time period as that area was getting infilled, um, the, the railroads, uh, you know, there's the, the railroad yard in there. The railroad was building its own set of pipes to, to drain its yard. And railroads historically are very protective of their infrastructure and they don't let anybody else touch it. And so for the next hundred or so years, that was the case. We had this major metropolitan pipe that was uh, controlled by the Metropolitan District Commission, eventually MWRA, that was the main source of draining a good portion of Somerville, an overflow pipe shared by Cambridge and, and Somerville, and railroad pipes that no one could touch. And so the, the next slide just sort of illustrates, I mean, these, these are fairly large brick pipes, you know, six to eight feet in diameter, but of course it is a pipe, so there, there is a capacity limitation to it. Obviously, it doesn't take as much water as, uh, as an open Millage River would. And so right from the beginning, there was always sort of flooding concerns. The next slide. So what drained down to this? You know, Somerville basically has three different um, major uh, sewer systems. And the, the largest of them on the next slide uh, that uh, drains about two thirds of, of the city here illustrated in red and, and purple, all of that area of Somerville drains down to that metropolitan uh, MWRA pipe. Uh, and, and so you can sort of imagine what sort of problems this, uh, this generates on the next slide, where you now have a low lying landlocked area that used to be a river where two thirds of the flow from the city goes into a capacity con constrained pipe that we share with MWRA. So the, the flooding problems that, that arise from this have, have been in existence for, for about 100 years um, and have been pervasive. And with climate change, and, and particularly some of the summers that we've seen recently, um, you know, we've seen many examples of that. And you can see some pictures of that on the next slide. And these are scenes that are, are familiar to, to many. And it's also important to remember that our system is an old system, it's a combined uh, system. Modern systems separate stormwater from the sanitary. Ours does not, it combines them in the same pipe. So during the heavy rains, uh, when the system is overloaded, particularly that MWRA pipe is overloaded, that old um, uh, overflow pipe that goes down McGrath then discharges raw sewage to um, the, the Charles. So now we go to the to the future of water. What has the city been doing to improve drainage and water quality? So again, you know, we're we're sort of constrained by this sort of pipe network that uh, moves water around. Uh, and and if you look at modern day, it's it's the same story. Um, this system backs up and causes flooding. And we've been doing a lot of work. Uh, the engineering department has been doing a lot of work with our consulting partners uh, over the past several years to develop a hydraulic model. So that we really understand the causes and potential solutions to uh, those, those flooding issues. So one of the major um, opportunities that, that we have uh, unlocked in the past few years that we didn't have for the past century actually is part of the M, uh, MBTA Greenline extension. Um, as part of that project uh, on the next slide, um, they are upgrading their drainage system uh, along those track lines. Um, and as many people know, the, MWR, the MBTA was in a financial crisis uh, and needed additional assistance from the cities of Cambridge and Somerville 
to move forward with the GLX pro uh, project, one of our conditions of paying into that and making the green line a reality was buying that excess capacity. So the MBTA designed that system so that it could handle floods on the track up to the 100 year flood, which means that anytime you've got a storm that's less than a hundred year flood or, or a um, you know, big flood that happens once every 100 years or has a 1% chance of happening in every in a given year, there's a whole bunch of excess capacity in that system that they're designing and building. So we essentially bought that excess capacity. So we're, we're unlocking a new way of treating stormwater. And that became the backbone for our, our Union Square project. Obviously, Saucy, which is under construction right now, uh, and we're currently designing uh, sewer separation in the upstream area of um, Spring Hill sewer separation, which has had its own sort of community outreach uh, in that neighborhood. And then now the, the Poplar Street pump station, which is that critical link uh, between the, the stormwater that comes through the pipes and getting it into the MBTA system. So, you know, what opportunity does that afford us? Um, we've been continuing on with our citywide flood mitigation and water quality analysis to both um, reduce the, the frequency and uh, uh, severity of flooding and reduce combined sewer overflows, which we're compelled to do um, by uh, EPA and, and federal regulations, well, state regulation. Um, part of that is, again, using that hydraulic model to understand the root cause of the flooding and opportunities to reduce it. And you know, this, this may be a little bit esoteric um, and people who aren't uh, well versed in this sort of um, analysis, but the areas in orange here um, are areas that uh, flood due to those downstream uh, restrictions. So if we do away with that, that, that pipe capacity uh, in the downstream, those areas can reduce flooding. And so the, the Poplar Street pump station is, is key in and of itself to reduce flooding in, in the areas you see here as, as orange. Additional work has to be done upstream to mitigate the, the flood areas in green. So, you know, let, let's, let's give a, a couple of examples from that, that master plan. If we look at the, the sort of um, Lincoln Park, Concord Ave area, this is the extent of flooding under current conditions for 10 year flood, which is sort of our, our baseline for for doing these things. And people who live in this neighborhood know these, these are the areas that are flood prone. Um, on the next slide, as soon as Saucy and the Poplar Street pump station are done and not doing anything else, we're able to reduce flooding. So Jonathan, you can toggle back and forth between the, the previous slide and this slide. So again, the Poplar Street pump station by itself doesn't solve all the problems, but it, it really does uh, help quite a bit. So then, the other thing it does is it allows us to do future projects. So by doing additional work in that Concord Street uh, Lincoln Park area and leveraging the capacity of the Pop Street Pump Station, we're able to almost eliminate flooding in, in that, uh, that area. And again, that would not be possible just with local interventions alone. This really depends on the Pop Street Pump Station to be operational in order for, for us to um, get interventions on this level. Another example uh, of flooding is that's well known as Duck Village. You know, here's here's the, the extent of flooding in Duck Village um, for a 10 year storm. And people who live in Duck Village can probably say this happens 10 times a year, not once every 10 years. Um, and, and again, on the next slide, you see what Papa Street Pump Station by itself does. Again, not you know earth shattering, but it does provide a, um, some alleviation there. And then by doing additional work in the Duck Village area and getting it uh, down into, into Poplar Street, um, we're able to make some some fantastic strides. So this is just an illustration of some of our, our long range planning and how it's really dependent upon Poplar Street to um, to get there. Um, now the the stormwater isn't the the only consideration. Uh, for our pump station. There are other broader contexts. Um, so I'd like to hand it off to Sarah Lewis right now uh, to, to give a little bit of the, the neighborhood uh, context for our uh, design here. 
Thank, thanks, Rich. Um, and hopefully there are a lot of people who are um, interested in in this topic that were part of the, the workshop um, last week for the, the Brick Bottom neighborhood. Um, we're, we're doing a visioning plan to try to incorporate all of these projects. Um, and as many of you know, the entire surrounding area is um, burgeoning, shall we say. Um, there, are, there are projects going on in Boynton Yards, 101 South Street is, is topped out. Um, everybody knows what's going on in, in Union Square, and I, I believe they're uh, planning on starting construction very, very soon. Um, uh, there are projects coming up in, in Brick Bottom itself um, and all along McGrath Highway. Um, the, the areas of, of Inner Belt um, and Twin City, um, Twin City has, has, uh, is doing quite well on, on its own, and so that's probably slower to develop. In the same way with Inner Belt, there is activity going along on Washington Street. Um, however, the deeper por portions of that neighborhood that are constrained by um, the tubes, as they are affectionately called, onto the tracks, uh, will probably be uh, a little bit slower to develop as well. But trying to understand what the big picture looks like um, in this area is, is one of the goals of P&Z. Um, next slide. Then the other big piece that's, that's important to keep in mind which directly affects um, the, the pump station site uh, with its adjacency to McGrath is the idea of grounding McGrath. Um, so there's two pieces here that are going on. Uh, for those who are involved in the Union Square neighborhood plan, um, the idea of making McGrath an actual urban boulevard, um, tree-lined, at grade, is, is still very much um, on the books. Uh, in fact, apparently DOT has just started their design work um, for that grounding project and um, expect to start construction in 2026. So we'll see how that moves forward. Um, the other piece that's going on that is actually separate from that is uh, this summer the Squires Bridge um, Hopefully I'm getting the right one. Yes, the Squires Bridge will start a repaving project. And so the construction that you'll see on McGrath is, is not to do because that bridge has to remain in place. They're repaving and upgrading that and that will actually have a road diet on it as well. So the number of lanes will be reduced and there will be um, bicycle and pedestrian uh, facilities added to, to make crossing the, the bridge between Somerville and Cambridge so it's safer for any kind of uh, mobility um, method. Um, but so that one, it will be separate than the a separate project by DOT than the, the grounding, but it does set up very well to, to lead us into the next step for getting McGrath actually down. So we're excited. Um, all right, thanks. And I think I am now handing it off to Emerson to uh, get into the project. And uh, now that we've give, given you too much information in the background, um, we'll, we'll give you a whole lot more uh, info on the pump station. Thank you, Sarah. Um, that, all that context is wonderful. If we go to the next slide, we're, we're going to talk about what's on the site, um, number 10 Poplar. Um, first, I want to touch on some of the stormwater objectives that um, are kind of an undercurrent to everything that was just discussed. So, um, you know, Rich touched pretty heavily on the first two bullets on the slide there, but there's a, a theme of climate change resiliency built into the city's plan for all of the stormwater infrastructure improvements. And um, beyond the pump station itself and the agreement that the city has made with MDTA, there's also a plan for an underground storage tank. And there uh, have been studies done and determined, you know, the optimum size for that tank and really trying to make best use of the available lot size before we start building everything on top of it and can no longer have access to put those facilities underground. We also need to keep in mind protection of water quality. There's various regulations that apply 
um, from the state and EPA as it relates to stormwater that is being newly separated in the city and will be discharging to the Charles River. Um, there's permits um, that um, govern those things. And so we, we have a, uh, we're charged with managing stormwater pollutants and it also goes to just overall operations of the stormwater system. Um, and so the, the pump station site and the facility itself becomes kind of a hub for the city to begin to um, be really proactive in meeting those water quality goals. Um, we also have a very important goal of emphasizing stormwater education, and that's something that we will touch on a few times throughout the, the slide deck. Next slide. So uh, here's everything that is proposed underground um, at the site, and it's um, the, the great thing, line work that you see is the above ground features, which my colleague Chris Bridal will be presenting shortly. Um, we have the pump station building on the left side. Underneath that, um, there's a variety of chambers and um, structures, predominantly the wet well, which holds submersible pumps. Those are rated for a peak capacity of 50 million gallons per day, uh, just for a scale size. If I were to stand on a football field with water up to about my shoulders, um, this pump station could pump that entire volume of water um, to the MBTA system in about an hour. Um, there are screening channels upstream of the, of the pumps um, to protect the pumps and also handle a lot of the debris that we can't allow to um, be passed down to the Charles River because that's stormwater that um, the Charles River currently is not impacted by. Um, there's a series of pipeline vaults and chambers. Um, there's pipes that leave, come to and from the site, and we're not going to get into that today, although it is something that we'll be presenting um, in future iterations of the project, so stay tuned for that. Um, we also have a large storage tank, 4 million gallons is the recommended size, and um, sited around the site, we have um, two pockets of green infrastructure. Next slide, please. So here we're zooming in on the pump station building a bit more. Um, inside the building, we have a debris management system. Um, there is an odor control concern with the facility, so the entire building is enclosing that and providing a system so that we don't have any um, nuisance odors coming out of the art farm. Um, truck operations will be enclosed so that those do not, those odors do not escape when um, those operations incur, occur, as well as to keep noise levels down. Um, there's a considerable uh, amount of infrastructure related to just the high voltage electrical systems for those 50 million gallon per day pumps and the control systems as well. We're gonna be interfacing with the MBTAs um, um, control system, and as other facilities are developed in the city, um, this uh, will serve as a central point for all those types of operations. Um, the building has all the typical types of systems you would imagine, bathrooms, HVAC, boilers, those kinds of things. Um, we also have um, seen an opportunity to integrate with the shed, which those familiar with the art farm will know um, had a very prominent role in the art farm, and um, this location of the building lends itself to merging those two building structures. Um, and there's also a green roof. So everything that is green that you see is um, um, conceived to have some sort of green roof stormwater infrastructure on top of the building. Next slide. So we're gonna go through some representative photographs that are I've selected that are of the scale of the type of facility that we're building. Next slide, please. So these are um, images of the underground chambers, large debris screens on the left, the wet well with pumps submerged underwater in the middle, and then a variety of chambers that are going to house ball, uh, uh, valves and flow meters and things like that. Next slide, please. Above grade um, at the building, we have the uh, screens themselves on the left daylighting, and the debris that they remove will be dumping into a dumpster that will be handled by truck. Um, we have an odor control system, a typical unit in the middle. And um, then other things, more typical buildings, you know, roof-mounted HVAC and boiler rooms and the like. Next slide, please. We're going to have some very industrial components to this facility. Um, there will be a, a high-voltage electrical room um, will be the centerpiece of the building. That's on the left side, something along those lines. We have a control room, which will house all of the computers and um, telecommunication systems for uh, everything to interact. Uh, a, a very important backup generator in the upper right corner. Um, this is proposed to be located outside the building. We have thoughts about locating it inside or perhaps on the roof of the building, but evaluated that and determined that it's best um, sited outside the building. 
And um, this is critical because um, if you go back and we look at some of the slides Rich was presenting earlier, you know, this area floods and um, there are power outages in the middle of large storms. And so we need to make sure that these pumps are up and running throughout the duration of the storm so we can maintain the level of service that it provides and not lose that capacity. And there's other basic things like electrical uh, transformers and service panels that are required of ever source electric. Next slide, please. Um, so we've talked about a lot of things below ground and we need access to those, um, but we also have a goal of hiding those um, beneath the wonderful art farm. And so we're thinking, you know, very proactively about hiding, um, you know, very kind of industrial things like manhole covers within paved systems. We can easily do that. There's good precedence for that. Um, in areas that are more operational driven, that um, the city um, DPW will need access to on a regular basis, like um, the pumps themselves will have hatches that allow access to um, underground. And then just general space for movement and parking of city vehicles as they come and go at the site. Next slide, please. Um, the, the largest and most costly element of the project is the underground storage tank. This is a 3.3 million gallon underground storage tank, wet weather storage tank. It was constructed in Ottawa by some of my colleagues. Um, and so this is a very accurate depiction of the scale of the facility that we're proposing. Um, in fact, the tank that we are proposing on this site is um, we're going to require about a 40 foot deep excavation in order to achieve the target volume. Next slide. So you might be thinking, wow, that's a, that's a large project and how disruptive that could be. Yes, the construction um, does have quite an impact um, to the site. That's what you see on the left, that project being constructed. But on the right, when it's finished, they had wonderful soccer field on top, and it was part of a um, community center that uh, the neighborhood desperately needed. And um, so they provided that amenity as well as flood relief. So it really has a lot of parallels with the Art Farm project. Next slide, please. Um, just wanted to show some representative photos of some of the other elements um, that will be engineered here. So the green infrastructure, um, you know, this can be integrated with pathways and make it a really attractive um, kind of, you know, urban vegetated environment. It doesn't need to be planters on the side of a road um, and swales and things like that. It can be quite an attractive, nice place to visit. And the green roof um, you can see for the, the building is um, becoming much more popular. And so we, we look forward to integrating that facility as well. Next slide, please. So um, let's stop here and talk about um, opportunities for stormwater education. As I mentioned, that's a, a very important goal of the project. And there's kind of three general ways that you can do stormwater education. Um, you've got an opportunity to do interpretive signage, which is very prescriptive. Um, it allows public to kind of, you know, learn about it themselves. We can reveal a hidden infrastructure by putting elements of the system on display, organizing tours. Or we can integrate with the site itself and um, you know, have stormwater um, actively part of the building design, the landscape design, and the surrounding street. So um, with there, I'm going to turn it over, I think, back to Jonathan, and we're going to do um, some live polling. Thanks, Everson. So this is the platform that I mentioned at the top of the meeting. So we're going to be using this, this platform called Mentimeter. Uh, we're going to be giving some instructions on how to access that in a second. Um, just once again, to reiterate, it's probably best to use a smartphone. Uh, it's fine to use a browser if you're just on the computer and that's all you have access to. Um, the only thing is that I will um, ask that folks return to the GoToWebinar to see the results once we've all had a chance to respond to that live poll. So here's the directions on how to access this. Um, tech savvy folks might notice a QR code in the corner. That's one way to access that. Um, but the more simple version of that is to go to menti.com, enter the code that will be displayed within the next screen at the top of the, the visible window. Um, you'll be able to answer the question. There you're going to see the options available to you. The, the question prompt we'll get into right after this. And then, like I said, return back to see the live results uh, coming into the uh, presentation. Bear with me for one second. Okay. So take a look at the Mentimeter. 
Hold on one second. Okay, so the the access code will be 7787-4925. And I see folks are already reacting to this. That's great. It looks like folks aren't going to have much of an issue. Um, reiterate that if you are not able to access this or you're listening by phone, um, you will be able to respond to a poll on the Summer Voice website shortly. We will we will send an email to tell you when that poll is live on the Summer Voice website. And the question is, what about this piece of infrastructure provides the best educational opportunities? Select up to three. So we'll give folks a solid minute to answer that and then we'll take a look at the results. So to read it live, just so folks that can't really see the screen very well, there's the Miller's River history, which we've gone over, uh, climate change, flood relief strategy, the pump station elements themselves, the underground storage tank, uh, stormwater quality, green infrastructure, green roof, and rain harvesting. So we're seeing some interesting results so far. It seems like there's a lot of competing and um, equally weighted options here where green infrastructure, flood relief strategy, and then secondarily climate change and the Millage River history are coming to the top here. Um, this isn't to preclude any of the other items. I definitely think we will have opportunities to discuss how to integrate more than that, um, but this is a good starting point for us to understand what the community is engaged with and what will be the most meaningful to see at this site. So I appreciate you all taking the time to respond to the poll. And once again, anyone that has not been able to, we will be posting a poll to the Summer Voice website. Okay, so for the next section, we'd like to talk about how this will integrate the wrong with the Run Farm project. Jonathan, oh, share your other screen. Sorry about that. All right, so I should be on the right screen now. You got it. How will this facility integrate with Art Farm? That's a huge question because we're talking about a lot of technical things that we need to fit into this site. And there's a lot of history with Art Farm process. And, and to speak to that, I want to bring in Luisa Oliveira, who a lot of you folks are probably um, uh, already introduced to. I will try to unmute you. Bear with us with some of the technical difficulties. This platform, while useful, has its quirks. Can you hear me, Jonathan? Yes, you are yeah. live. Okay, I, I have voice now. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks to all of the folks who have, are in attendance today. I'm Luisa Oliveira, Director of Public Space and Urban Forestry. We are a group of landscape architects and urban foresters who are um, working on the public realm. And you may remember that we've been working with you on this project, along with Gregory Jenkins and a team, architectural and landscape architecture team over under, and a local uh, landscape architecture team from East Somerville, ground view on uh, the art farm. And we've been working on this for quite uh, a long time. So specifically, they, the engineers have thrown a lot of technical information. I know it's a lot, but I want to talk about how that has some continuity with the project that we've been working on and how these two will integrate. And also to assure you that there will be time for uh, answering these questions and kind of getting a good understanding of all the stuff um, that's being thrown at you tonight. So uh, if we go to the next slide, these are just some images of the meetings we've had in the past. If you'll remember, it started off with a lot of different uh, focus groups with the Arts Council talking about a what was then envisioned as a temporary site, be, becoming a gateway to the, neighbor, to the neighborhood and facilitating arts and culture. And then um, 
with a lot of great advocacy from all of you, we were able to move it into a project that was more permanent. And then with the art barn and the art farm, and that even became more so um, with it becoming a net zero building. But I do really wanna go back to the original tenants of the conversations that we've had for all of these years. So in the next slide, we can see these are, um, some drawings that were done by Kelby, who's a local artist, that were recording much of the conversations that we had in the early days. And what came out of all that process were, is that there were four tenants to the art farm that we really wanted to honor and, and think this project is still honoring. So one of them was to create a place for arts and cultural engagement, which will happen with the barn, and also with the plaza in front of it, with the opportunity to have festivals, with the opportunity to have theater space, with the opportunity to have plaza activity and um, uh, uh, what all the things that can happen outside and inside and with the community space that's inside of the art barn, which leads us to the second one of community utility. We want this to be a space that community members can use um, for a number of different things, not just having meetings, but also um, a source of creativity and have a utility for different groups that are doing different kind of work in Somerville. And then the third is the environmental sustainability and all of the words that just came before us are really kind of the very exciting part of this project in that what has developed is beyond environmental sustainability where some of the conversations were about education and having a tree lab where we were testing uh, what species would respond well to climate change but we're actually now uh, integrating with the poplar street pump station creating a working landscape that is uh, a really great opportunity to explain climate change what that means for water how ur an urban system is dealing with stormwater and how a landscape can be a performance landscape that's actually solving a problem right under our feet. So the opportunity to, to plan for climate change and also to educate visitors to the park about what is happening with climate change just kind of kicked up a notch. And then the second, the rather the fourth uh, tenant that we talked about was economic development. And that was giving uh, artists, performers, a place to have events, generating money for more creative economy, um, and conversations that were had about music, art shows, theater, all of that. So um, I wanna say that we, we really, even though this is, uh, I know for many of you, seems like it's taking an eternity, I feel that way sometimes too, um, this part of the project is actually really bringing this up to a different level. If we go to the next slide, this is pretty much where we left you with what the site would look like, and so you remember there was an art barn that had um, allows for performance and theater space. That festival plaza I talked about, an area for uh, food trucks and um, the community gardens and the greenhouse that's there, the refrigerator that serves uh, Groundwork Somerville to have some um, urban agriculture utility, and then other areas where people can gather. That all all of those program elements are in this project. And what we had originally shown was that we wanted to create a pastoral space into phase two. That was the, the last um, iteration that you all have seen. And what we've really guided the uh, Poplar Street project to do, working with Over Under and working with Grandview, was to try to stay within this vision in as much as they can, because obviously they're working with a lot of technical parameters. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Chris, who's the landscape architect on the Stantec team. And he's gonna talk about the, some of the features that are um, being developed on the second phase and how they integrate with our site so that it reads as one unified site, which happens to have an incredible uh, infrastructure system underneath it that is serving to plan for climate change. So Chris, it's all yours. Thanks, Louisa. Can everyone hear me okay? That's, uh, that's great. So this is, this is really just to, um, the slide is to explain the goals that were guiding us, as Louisa mentioned, um, and that the sort of the pump station side of the site was really to, to, to really emphasize and um, 
and maximize the amount of green open space while maintaining all of the uh, great art farm uh, program that had been established. We wanted to make sure that we're blending sort of the two sides together so it doesn't feel like two halves, but it feels like one integrated cohesive design. Um, and we want to make sure that the perimeter and access to the site is safe um, and that the connections from a graph are also uh, safe and and useful and, and um, integrated with the rest of Somerville and the city and Brick Bottom. So let's go to the next slide. So this is our um, current design. Um, you can see on the right, a lot of the areas of, of the previous um, iteration are still in place. But the, the, the goal for us here um, as Stantec and, and William Rawn Architects over under um, and ground view is to, um, is to create this one holistic composition that is artful, that is playful, that keeps all the program in place. Um, so we're looking forward to showing this to you. We're gonna dive into it and show you some more detail um, and uh, get your input. Next slide. We just wanted to also emphasize why this site exists. It's about um, creating a home for sort of existing agriculture and farm program the greenhouse that exists, the community garden that exists, the refrigerator that exists. Um, and it's also obviously also part of a, a really great artistic community. And so obviously the idea of the art farm is to integrate these two ideas together and create a really great vibrant um, public space that is a home for these wonderful uh, initiatives. Next slide. So now we're sort of Flipping the angle of the site, we're going to dive down into the site and show you the different programs. First, we're going to show you, uh, there's the next slide, the program that's in place in the current design. Um, the community garden has a very strong uh, place in the site. Uh, next to the greenhouse, as Emerson mentioned, the shed is now integrated into the pump house building. Um, the festival grove, festival plaza, sorry, is still the sort of main a uh, central uh, feature of the site next to the Festival Grove. The rain, rain garden um, is still there uh, up at the top right. And we've we've moved the tree lab uh, down to the sort of uh, Poplar and Route 28 corner. Uh, we think this is a really great location because it's next to the art barn. It's part, it sort of creates this massing uh, that's sort of uh, in, in sync with the art barn. But it's also, I think, a great synergy with with the sort of pastoral and urban forest aspect of the more pastoral side of the site. Uh, next slide. So now we're gonna show you the additional elements that have been uh, uh, added to, to the site. It's always part of the original vision, but these are, these, are, these are how they're currently being realized. The pastoral lawn is obviously a really important uh, component. We want to make sure we've got a really lovely rolling pastoral landscape. It's, as much as we can. Uh, next slide. And then we've created this, we think a wonderful sculptural element in, in this amphitheater element that is integrated into the pastoral lawn where you can sit underneath the shade trees, eat the sandwich underneath the shade, have a, you know, look at, look at the people playing on the lawn. Um, and then as the amphitheater sort of peels off uh, next to the uh, festival plaza, it becomes a place for you to sit and um, and watch festivals and events. Uh, the urban forest and native meadow is a sort of buffer experience um, that buffers the park from Route 28. Uh, the urban forest obviously is a very important uh, city-wide initiative that we want to try and um, uh, have here also. If we go to the next slide. And then the rain garden sculpture. This is an important moment that we'll get to later in the presentation, but this sort of shows, uh, this is a sort of a really important moment at the corner of Route 28 and Poplar Street, where we announce this green, this lovely green open space. It's a moment to sculpture and it's a threshold into this, uh, this new park space. Next slide. And then last but not least, this is, uh, may seem innocuous to, to some, but I think is a really important element of integrating uh, this site into the brick bottom uh, urban fabric by creating these raised tables that create traffic calming, pedestrian friendly moments, almost like squares, plazas that take you into the site 
Um, and then we've got these great improved streetscapes with potential for bike lanes, lots of street trees. Um, and so we think this is going to be a great initiative to integrate this park into the urban fabric. Next slide. So this is, um, this is we have our sort of back into the brick bottom community. We're looking into the site. Uh, this is um, a, an example of the pedestrian friendly intersection. It's a gateway moment from the brick bottom neighborhood into the site. You can see the art barn architecture by over under in front of us. And then the stairs that create these lovely uh, uh, cafe, sort of raised cafe space, but also this seating threshold into the space. Next slide. We wanted to show you previous iterations of the of the design. This is uh, uh, a, a design before the sort of uh, the green pastoral side of the site had been designed. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that the uh, McGrath Highway is now hidden behind the urban forest, um, and that we're now shrouded by this lovely green um, urban canopy, and that the Festival Plaza and the and the and the um, Festival Grove is still there, but now we have this lovely amphitheater space. So it's, it's a much greener, lusher experience. Next slide. Again, a prior iteration. Uh, this time we've got our back facing uh, sort of the McGrath Highway um, and, um, and uh, shows the Festival Plaza in the foreground. If we go to the next slide. Now we're sitting at the top of the amphitheater looking back down onto the plaza the Festival Plaza um, shows the sort of sculptural playful quality of the amphitheater um, and also shows the opportunity for sort of passive seating, eating a sandwich, having a coffee uh, during the day, but also obviously a wonderful opportunity and, and, and place for sitting and watching events. The art barn becomes this canvas for projections and movies. And as, the, as we open up the art barn, it also became, becomes a place for concerts and events. So I, we think that this, uh, this uh, Amphitheater element is a wonderful addition to this to this uh, original design. Next slide. Now we have our back again to the brick bottom neighborhood, but on the other corner from the art barn, um, we're looking back towards the McGrath Highway, looking at the art barn. This image is to show that the community garden uh, and the agricultural component is a large component of the site. Uh, that it's integrated with the pump station building. You can see, see the shed there on the right hand side, the refrigerator, the greenhouse. Um, and we've created this sort of vertical trellis structure as an opportunity for vertical gardening, but also as this sort of signage moment that sort of uh, carefully and, and um, deliberately separates the art and farm sides of, of the uh, design, but I think in a playful way with this, this, this signage element. Next slide. Now we have our back to um, the McGrath Highway. Again, we're looking back into the site. We're looking at the pastoral lawn. The rain garden is in the foreground. Uh, the amphitheater is in the far ground, and then the urban forest and the pastoral lawn is in the mid ground. And you might be able to see the pump station behind the canopy of the urban forest, but it's deliberate in that it hopefully is not that visible. It's integrated into the landscape as part of the landscape and not as a, a separate building structure. Next slide. Now we've sort of reversed back when they were now sort of almost underneath the, uh, the existing McGrath Highway, looking back to the site. This is showing that sort of threshold moment into the park, using the green space and the urban canopy as a vista into the park. And it's an opportunity for sculpture. Um, this is a placeholder, holder, placeholder for sculpture. And we hope that there's more input and discussion about what that could possibly be. But I think it shows how this space can announce itself as a as a lovely green space along Route 28. Next slide. Now we're walking north along Route 28, and we're seeing the pump station building peeking out through the landscape, through the tree canopy. Uh, we've recessed the building back slightly from the street edge, so it creates this pocket park moment that can also be a location for green infrastructure. Uh, it could be, uh, we're actually deliberately setting it back so that it could be a place for people to stop uh, and wait for buses. Um, and obviously it's a place for art and, and, and mural as a canvas and we'd love to get your input on that also. One thing that's maybe a little bit, bit difficult to see here that's noted is a window 
to infrastructure is that we've opened this little aperture in the side of the building so that people can see in and see the infrastructure as a sort of art exhibit almost um, as part of the theme of art, you know, using this idea of, of green infrastructure as an expose for what this, uh, this pump station building is all about. Uh, one thing I should also mention is that, uh, sorry, uh, is that the McGrath Highway uh, uh, is going to be uh, lowered in the future. It's going to be boulevarded, and that this site, this this design, and this edge is is will accommodate that future condition, and we'll have lots lots more green trees, hopefully, along that edge and a wider sidewalk. Um, lastly, we would just want to show you our thoughts and ideas about integrating environmental art and education into the site. Um, and we like we like this idea of capturing rainwater from the two buildings, from the from the art barn, and also from the uh, from the pump station building, taking the rainwater, channeling it down this uh, this artful um, environmental art element that can be exposed in the in in, in the uh, park design as a maybe a runnel, and that culminates at this corner uh, for a rain garden and sculptural moment. So. We, we want to make this idea of um, stormwater management and environmental art a key component and a very visible component to uh, to the site where there also may be interpretive uh, signage to help people understand what's happening. Next slide. Um, and so this is also showing how the roofscape of the pump station building again is integrated into the landscape. It's not a separate building. It's it's symbiotic and related to the undulations and sculptural quality of the landscape. Uh, that we we would like to plant native meadow planting on top of the lower roofscape, um, uh, um, and that's a place for uh, habitat creation. Uh, that also then weaves its way down into the site um, and becomes an experiential landscape. Uh, for native uh, native planting and and habitat creation, as I mentioned. Next slide. So this is our, our, our my last slide, I should say. I mean, it's a sort of segue into um, another Mentimeter where we'd like to get your input on uh, on the art that could be uh, could be part of this site. We've made some suggestions about the mural, about the sort of environmental runnel idea. Uh, the signage, I think, is a playful uh, opportunity for art, but there may also be other opportunities and locations for permanent or temporary or interactive sculpture. Um, we had this uh, idea about possibly opening a window in in the ground plane, looking down into the reservoir below and having projection art inside the uh, inside the reservoir. Um, it's actually been done before um, and we think could be could be a a great idea. So with that, I will hand it over to Jonathan and um, and we'll get moving. Thanks all. All right. So this is a ton of information. Uh, we wanted to break things up a little bit. We're going to do another live poll. So we're going to go back to Mentimeter. It's going to be a different poll question. Um, so let's review how to get into here. So again, go to menti.com on a separate device or in a different browser window. Uh, you'll enter the code that we end up displaying on the next screen. You'll answer that question, and then we're going to come back to the webinar screen, and we'll shortly discuss the results of that. Again, this will be replicated within the Summer Voice page, so if you can't access it on the fly, no big deal. We'll definitely get everyone's feedback. It's kind of how I started to get into Google, like applying for teaching. Kind of like meeting people and connecting in that way. Yeah, yeah. So it's like. Okay, so what other opportunities or ideas do you have for public and environmental art? So this is an open platform. You can basically say whatever you'd like everyone to see. So please keep it. Uh, up to public standards, if you would. I appreciate that. Um, so we won't be able to really review every single thing, uh, but we're gonna definitely be creating some um, 
feedback loops here. We'll take all this input and we'll try and in incorporate it in some fashion, specifically as we gather feedback from the polling on the Summer Voice website so that everyone has a chance to give their feedback. So if we take a look as uh, answers start rolling in, we see a lot of uh, advocacy for local art, and that's great. We definitely want that to be part of the mix. Um, some, some sculpture ideas, more of a live performance type of thing with puppet shows, um, reservoir, and temporary exhibits. It's a great idea. We can definitely envision uh, opportunities to rotate things and give folks access to actually incorporate their art into the site. So that's definitely ever present in our in our planning for this project. So that's definitely over a minute. Uh, we'll definitely be reviewing these results after the fact. So any of this uh, feedback that I haven't read live, please don't think that it's just going to disappear. We're definitely going to take a look at everything. And we really appreciate you giving your feedback live. Um, obviously, it's a little strange to do these virtually. This would be something you'd probably vision board in person. But uh, we felt this was a good opportunity to try and use technology to accomplish that in some fashion. So I appreciate the patience and engaging with this process. OK. So moving on, we um, wanted to get to the next polling question. Sorry, I did a technical snafu. Please bear with me. OK, so we're going to go to the next polling question. We're going to do one more. So what in the overall project do you find most compelling? So anything you've seen tonight um, that has stuck out to you, uh, things that you're really passionate about seeing uh, to fruition when we come up with our final designs, uh, anything that you want to volunteer is welcome. So we'll give a few minutes. Um, again, the, the code is 77874925. And this is going to appear as a bit of a word cloud, which is interesting. So um, if anyone has the same ideas, we'll definitely see the prominence of that. we we'll give folks a few minutes to give their feedback, digest the question, and interact with this. Okay, great. Yeah, we see quite a clustering around the green space aspects of the project, which is excellent. We've definitely um, done as much as we can to maximize that space. And with the technical challenges that we're working with, it's definitely something we've had to balance. So it's, it's great that that's being seen as a valuable piece because we definitely put a lot of effort towards maximizing that. Yeah, trees, green space, urban forest. There's a lot of other uh, pieces here being reported in. So this is great feedback. We really appreciate this. Um, we're going to turn back to the slideshow. We're going to go over a couple other um, pieces here. The, we're going to go through a question and answer session now, which is going to allow you to submit questions uh, by text in the in the GoTo platform, and we will have some time to unmute folks as well. So we'll start with the text questions. So we'll be reading through those, and then we'll be uh, teeing the right folks up to answer those questions. Um, bear with me, I am not on the right screen. Okay, so we should see the question and answer session slide. And to give you the context of how you can answer your question, first we're gonna start with the chat question. So You'll see this window uh, in the GoToWebinar platform where you can submit that. We will see the questions as a, as a table, and we'll start teasing those out and teeing them up for folks. So we'll give a couple of minutes to generate those questions, and then uh, there will be, uh, there's likely to be questions we don't get to tonight. We will answer all the questions, so we will probably push some of those to the Summer Voice website. Again, we will email blast when that is done, so uh, folks will be aware of it. It won't be something that just kind of gets posted and gets forgotten about. Uh, so at this point, 
I'm going to start teasing out some of these questions and we're going to uh, get the right folks to answer them. And then after that, we'll probably have an opportunity to unmute some folks. So let's start with, um, okay, bear with me while I read the questions. I don't want to paraphrase, so I want to get the questions accurate. So trees in this area, one by the bus stop on Route 28, often do not do very well. With the pastoral lawn, et cetera, by Route 28, will there be a crew to maintain and take care of the trees? It's a great question. So um, Rich or Louisa, do you want to address this? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so um, the tree and the trees and the landscape, of course, will be maintained as other open spaces are um, throughout the city. So they do get preventative care. They will be planted uh, as any other green spaces. Could we get some Virginia creeper growing up the barn? We could also build trellises to support vines if we didn't want to have the vine on the building proper. It would be lovely if the material treatment on the barn would be conducive to suckering vines. Again, these are all great suggestions, but we're just not there yet. We haven't picked a planting palette yet, um, but we will be maximizing the green space and the vertical green space in this area. To that point, I will bypass other species questions that are being um, put forward. I apologize to anyone that doesn't hear their question read live, but for the sake of getting the most people's questions answered, we're gonna bypass those. Is there not room to have a protected bike lane along McGrath? So this is a tricky question because so much of what is going on with McGrath is up to MassDOT's design process. I know that they are doing a limited amount of work to do ADA compliance and get folks onto the sidewalks properly in the area. And then there'll be some interim uh, design around improving McGrath. I don't know the particulars of that. I think that we would probably have to speak to Brad Rawson about that to get that answered properly. Uh, but then the Boulevard project itself is definitely a future condition that we can't truly speak to. Okay, bear with me while I find the next question. Uh, it would be lovely to have a musical sculpture. Okay, hold on, I'll get to the next question. What is the project status and future timeline? Rich. After our question and answer section, we're going to uh, get into some detail on the next steps. So we'll, we'll discuss the, um, the work plan from here uh, and the timeline once we're done with Q&A. Next question. What kinds of textures and details will there be? Can there be water feature to replace all the concrete? So I would say that at this point in the design, we definitely have not selected any textures or materials. That's definitely a future decision to make. Um, specifically about the water feature, I don't know how to quite answer that. I do think there will be some concrete elements at the site to support the infrastructure. However, we will be hiding those as much as feasible. Also, Chris did present a water feature, the runnel, and we will be exploring how we can reveal what's happening with water underneath and water in general as it relates to climate change. So um, those are all things that we're exploring and all things that we also need to think about the maintenance of a heavily used public space on. Please explain more about debris removal and how often it will be occurring as well as where the DPW trucks will be accessing the mentioned dumpster? So that's a good question. We didn't really delve into the details of that. Um, and and <laughs> we, could, we could spend a lot of time, but generally um, the, the orientation of the building was purposefully done so that that um, operations happen on the McGrath side 
and not on the art farm side. So it's, it's almost like back a house. Um, in terms of the frequency of the truck visits, um, you know, under current, current operations, it would probably be about once or twice a day, um, you know, as, as we scale up and get more area contributing to this, it might be as frequent as three, maybe four times a day on the outside, um, but it's, it's not um, a, a constant uh, sort of uh, operational buzz and, and definitely compatible with the, with the public use of the site. Next question, how many people can the amphitheater accommodate? Chris, do you think you can take this question? Um, yeah, we have, we've not, um, let me put my camera on here. We have not um, calculated the capacity of the amphitheater, but it's something we we can certainly do. Um, it's. Uh, We've sized it so that it feels uh, appropriate to the size of the site. Um, and I think it's probably um, uh, something, it's certainly something we can, we can calculate and get back to folks with. Okay, next question. Where will the outflow pipe from the pump station run, Poplar or Fitchburg? Rich? So this is something we're still working through uh, design and um, it has to be coordinated with the uh, MBTA because it has to do with our physical connection to their system. We did have a very positive meeting with them about uh, two weeks back now. Um, I think all of our preferred route is uh, straight down Poplar um, and, and not doing the Fitchburg. Uh, I think Fitchburg is, is very much our plan B, um, but at this point we haven't uh, got to 100% yes on the Papa Street connection. So that, that's a detail we're working on. Okay, next question. Can the art barn shed be an opportunity for more art? And the next comment is related to um, ask if they can have murals on it. I think some of the uh, the surface elements of the of the shed are still elements in design. And I, I like these recommendations, and, and I, um, I, I'd encourage people to continue to go to the Summer Voice sites so that we can build some consensus uh, around uh, you know those those details as we advance the uh, um, the project. Next question: Is there the possibility of adding more trees and giving them room to grow slash mature and having less concrete generally? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So we absolutely want to maximize the number of trees that we add, but we also do need to have some hardscape if we're going to have uh, performance or outdoor events. So that's what we're really trying to balance is what is the landscape element? How can we make that rich and sustainable, maintainable? And then also how can we allow for enough hardscape to have the performances and gathering creative space that has been part of the vision from the beginning? Okay, next question. The pump station seems to be focused on handling climate change, but not stopping it. How is this stormwater going to be used to reduce our potable water demands rather than just dumping it into the Charles River? Rich? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the pump station itself um, doesn't necessarily do that. It's, it's um, at a point low down in the system where it's already commingled with a, a lot of street runoff. Um, it's quite dirty. Um, but you know we, we are moving towards um, for, for our own municipal building projects, and we're looking at ways to encourage private, um, uh, both developers and then uh, independent homeowners to, to um, better use the stormwater on their own site. Um, so like this, this isn't the location for that. We are doing a whole bunch of other work to encourage that um, closer to the, to the source uh, and, and reuse um, on, on sites. Next question. What is design approach to Poplar Street Edge? Looks unprogrammed. 
Uh, Chris, do you mind taking this one? I think it's respective to the access points. I think it's a good way to answer this one. Sure. Yeah, and the Poplar Street edge, I you know, I think it's 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 kind of got two parts to it. It's the 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 architectural edge, which I think creates a nice street edge. Um, there is a transition of grade that needs to happen in front of the art barn that's being accommodated uh, in front of the art barn. Uh, sort of, I guess, uh, west of the art barn is considered to be the more open sort of permeable edge where you can see into the pastoral green space and we're actually proposing a, a rain garden along Jonathan, that edge. Can you go to the next slide? It has the entire site plan. It might be easier for people to. Great point. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so yeah, as I was explaining that in front of the art barn uh, is a, it's a great transition that needs to be accommodated, uh, but the art barn itself creates a uh, sort of urban street edge west of that, which is towards us on this sort of aerial view, we have a permeable uh, vista into the, the green open space and we have a rain garden at the, at the perimeter as a sort of uh, colorful um, edge that um, that explains sort of, I guess, the ethos, ethos of the site, which is to be um, a green sustainable uh, um, example for, uh, for, for site design. Next question. Groundwork Somerville has maintained a large raised bed at our farm for several years to grow culturally relevant food for the Somerville Mobile Farmers Market. Will we be given a space in the community garden to continue this programming and incorporate community education slash engagement with our World Farmers Program? Uh, Rich? Yeah, I, I think the short answer to that is is yes. There's there's no intention to, to severing um, the ties with that program. Um, in fact, Lisa Robinson's in the audience. Um, I can I can unmute her and, and uh, let her describe to anyone uh, who doesn't know about that program a little something about that program because I think it deserves some attention. Unless Lisa is off uh, attending to <laughs> her son at the moment. Oh, there there she is. No, I'm here. Yes, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, we have been on that site. Um, it's actually has worked out to be a great um, public, uh, nonprofit, private partnership with the Mobile Farmers Market and Groundwork Somerville and Green City Growers. And I think we're entering our fifth year. And we just see this as a great opportunity to continue to um, have a more visible presence there. You know, we've been doing it. And we're excited to have it in a more public space. And I think the details of the the raised bed and those um, the dimensions of it, you know, I think will be hashed out with you guys. But I I see this just being enhanced at that site. Thank you. It is good. So next question: With the storage tank directly below the pastoral lawn, how many feet will trees have for root growth? Uh, Emerson, could you take this one? Sure. Um, actually, the, the pump station, excuse me, the storage tank is largely sited underneath the hardscape plaza um, and the community gardens. Um, and, you know, it was it kind of worked out that way, frankly. Um, we do have a goal for uh, five feet of plantable soil depth above the tank um, that would support like the festival grove type of plantings. But over in the um, pastoral lawn area, um, really what we're going to be doing is you know, having full depth for tree root growth. Um, so I think we'll have an opportunity for very mature trees over time. Great, next question. Do pedestrians get access to water? Like in Millennium Park in Chicago, people can put their feet in a four inch deep stream. Um, Louisa. You're muted. Uh, sorry, so that is going to depend largely on um, what the water feature is and where that water is coming from. I know on other water features, we can't reuse water that's captured, uh, and it has to be, there's a number of health requirements about it being from the water system. So we're going to carefully look at all of those things uh, 
the idea of people engaging with water is a is a great one but again we have to balance whether we're then using city water to do that and whether we're able to do it with this water there's a lot to be considered here so um, again we have not the water feature hasn't been fleshed out but that's certainly uh, something that we will consider next question uh, Louisa stay ready your concept shows summer growth what is the vision for our five months of winter I guess I don't understand that question the, the concepts shows summer growth of plants because um, normally these concepts always do show plants when they're blooming the landscape in the winter will be a typical New England landscape so these plants will lose their leaves the perennials will go dormant just like any other um, New England landscape so I don't know if the question is will there be winter interest in the landscape and to that I would say yes we will try to have a palette that's responding to all seasons uh, but the winter landscape will be a New England winter landscape okay next question how about a windmill or water wheel generating electricity Rich. It's a fascinating idea. Um, I, I do think we're rapidly running out of space on this site, but uh, we can see what else we can jam in <laughs> to, to 2.1 acres. Okay, next question. What are the potential problems to having this infrastructure below our farm? Uh, Emerson. Well, um, you know, it actually has an opportunity to provide a benefit. Um, you know, there is a, a modeled flood condition on the surrounding streets. And so our firm has an opportunity to buffer against flooding in this area. Um, we are, we've, you know, we sided the tank so it's not sitting below any of the building foundations. So that kind of decouples the, the large tank from the buildings and potential issues of settlement. So we've thought through those types of issues. Um, and we've, you know, maintenance of the tank itself has been a, a very major concern uh, of the team. We've, we've had a lot of productive conversations about how that could be effectively done without impacting the public's use of the space. Um, and it's not a, a frequent activity, frankly. Um, so, you know, those are details that will be worked out as part of the design. So it would really kind of fold into the operation and maintenance plan for the overall facility. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, please, um, we can continue that conversation. Thank you. Might have lost Jonathan. His camera has frozen, so I'll I'll pick up, assuming that it's not my computer that's frozen. Will there be any solar panel features? Uh, yeah, it's it's not rendered on these drawings, but the the plan is for Art Barn, and we have the possible capacity on uh, the pump station building to have solar sort of panels, and that is actually part of the net zero um, uh, incorporation that we're working into Art Barn right now. Can the chain link fences be removed, and Art fencing be uh, created by local uh, artists, something more funky you often see in uh, community gardens. Well, the, the chain link fences are um, a temporary feature here on the site um, because we are using it as construction uh, staging for Saucy. Um, and largely as that starts to sunset, this will turn into a construction site. So uh, I wouldn't consider those chain link fences a permanent feature. Uh, will everything be handicapped accessible? Absolutely. Um, this, by federal law, has to be um, handicapped uh, accessible. So ADA compliance uh, is a base criteria for us. Uh, would love the shed to be stories higher, similar to the size uh, of the dealership. Um, and there could be business side restaurants too. Um, 
uh, in terms of the, the the size of the building, um, I think we've we've masked it for the the minimum that we need for the mechanical equipment. Um, it might be interesting to think of it in in a large form um, in other program uses. I think the the other limitation is you know, just how big the site is uh, in in getting uh, you're really having to focus on open space here rather than uh, restaurants. I think it's certainly something to consider for the larger neighborhood plan uh, on the adjacent sites. Uh, could concrete barriers at the, I'm sorry, uh, the print is very small on my screen here. The concrete barriers at the entrance could be an opportunity for more art, such as uh, mosaics and other art forms. Uh, there's just too much concrete. Um, it, it, again, I think um, this is some good feedback for uh, both the, the ground view and Stantec team to, to consider in terms of the overall planning. Some of the some of the hardscape is definitely part of the program that's been agreed to in terms of the plaza um, and and the maximization of the other um, softscape is uh, you know what, what we're trying to incorporate in the rest of the site. Uh, so, uh, Uh, will this be open 24 seven or is there a fence gate to close it? Uh, interesting question. I, as we're currently envisioning it, there, there isn't um, the idea to close this in terms of operational hours. Um, Lucy, I don't know if you have any history uh, on the ideas for operational hours. Um, so parks are generally closed at 10 p.m. I think it's going to probably follow similar rules, unless of course there's an event or or something like that. We really haven't um, given much thought to the operational uh, rules or how we'll deal with that because we're really focused on on just moving the project forward. But I would imagine it would be something like that because also the neighborhood, the adjacent neighborhood, will will want to keep some level of quiet hours. Uh, this is one possibly for Emerson might know off the top of his head of him or say, I don't know this. What is the height of the two pump station buildings? Well, oh, um, I, th I think we're in the range of 25 feet Dinner for the... Stopped. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. I think that the, the building that's closest to the northern edge of the site is about 25 feet or so. Um, and then the, the site with the green roof is um, a little bit slower. We have our architect for the building, Eric Kellander, on, so I'll let him. Yeah, I thought I'd jump in there for you, Emerson. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we were trying to hold the, the uh, in the view, the, the front building uh, as low as possible to allow the, the roof to tilt and make the meadow visible, the green roof on that one as an extension of the landscape. But the back bar, the bar with the mural at the end, uh, is that buffer uh, from from the north and is actually designed to house the the vac trucks, the, the vacuum trucks that clean out the um, uh, storm drains to be able to roll inside that, the door to shut, and it to tilt and dump uh, the contents of it. So it's it's about 25 feet interior. I think it's more a 28 foot uh, exterior with a you know the roof assembly and it's got a uh, either a green roof or or potentially solar uh, panels on that higher roof. Um, so that's about the the height. That is uh, slightly lower than the neighboring Mercedes Benz dealership, just for reference, and roughly equivalent uh, to the peak of the Art Barn, uh, kind of as a scale comparison. Um, I think that that's Thanks, enough, Eric. Rich. You the next question. Yeah, that's no, wonderful. I, I forgot you were on the panel. Should have tossed that one right to you. <laughs> um, uh, is there an access street uh, running between Art Farm site and what is now Heard Chambers? Yes, there is, and you know that's that's the you know access roadway that that we need for um, you know the the sewer department to access the, the pump station. Um, and the idea is still sort of what, what was the original concept with Art Farm is that, you know, during events that could be used for, you know, food trucks or, or you know, other ways to, to support the, the site. Um, so that that is still part of 
on the overall site plan. Uh, what types of lighting will they be? Chris, do you have an idea on that one? Yeah. So um, th there'll be various different types of lighting. I think the general concept is for the lighting to be uh, to not to, the lighting uh, fixtures to not be uh, big obtrusive elements to be hidden within the landscape. There are actually certain views where we're showing these mast lights, which will light the festival plaza, and then I think we'll 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 sort of secrete and hide lighting around the site, maybe using tree down lighting, maybe using benches and under lighting to do subtle subtle um, and uh, sort of. Uh, graceful ways of illuminating the site. So we, we don't want the lighting to be obtrusive. We want it to be elegant and um, complementary to the design. Thanks, Chris. Um, and looks like the last uh, question in the question feature is, are there guidelines for assigning a budget for maintenance? Uh, will this require a, a private public partnership for conservancy? I doubt that this is in um, the, the triple P uh, realm, um, but developing uh, the, the operations and maintenance plan, as well as uh, assisting in the development of the budget is certainly something that this team will be doing as we hand it over to DPW um, for maintenance, which is something across the board. Um, we're looking to increase our um, capabilities with and on how we hand over these uh, projects for long-term uh, maintenance. Um, and there, there's a new question. Um, what became of the proposal to shift Poplar Street uh, to allow better connectivity with Somerville Avenue? Um, I think some of the, the larger um, neighborhood plans uh, and uh, how they interface particularly uh, with the McGrath Boulevard projects um, are things that um, will be developed as the McGrath Boulevard project uh, continues. You know, again, as has already been said, that's uh, a state project, so they're very much in the driver's seat. Um, but certainly, Brad Ross and his team are advocating uh, for our, you know our our input, um, as is uh, Sarah Lewis from the from the planning team. So those are details to uh, that that will be worked up, particularly with Poplar Street, and and how we uh, interface with that. Um, that does it for the questions. Hugh Han had raised his hand, which I don't know uh, if that was a, uh, a mistake uh, or not. But I'll uh, unmute Hugh and give him an opportunity to ask a question or provide a comment. Uh, if he does indeed want to do that. Uh, Richard, thank you. That, that, in fact, was a mistake to uh, raise my hand. I didn't see that I had touched that uh, that button, but thank you very much. I'm very happy that we at least tested that the interface works. So if anyone else does want to ask a question or provide a comment, um, maybe Hugh can tell you how it is that you press a button and raise your hand. Um, I think you drop your cell phone on the floor a couple of times during the presentation. That might do the trick as well. Thanks, Hugh. I see a question from Tori, Tony, Tori Antonio, Antonino. Um, yeah, pretty close. Uh, Tori Antonino. Hi, everybody. This looks wonderful. Absolutely amazing. I'm so excited. Um, just like, I feel like it's a home run. I know I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but it looks great. Um, my question was, well, a couple questions. One was, you know, is it would it be possible to do um, what's called a Miyawaki forest? It's a very intentional, um, a very intentional way of of planting trees and shrubs close together to to maximize growth and um, allow for a a really thick screening of plants, which would be you know optimal to have along Route 28 because we know the dangers of the particulate matter. Of being so close, you know, to a highway, 
Um, so that was one thought, like instead of having the pathway, like basically having the pathway um, a little bit to the right, like a little bit more into the site and having and, and doubling up on the forest um, on that Route 28 edge. That's one question. And the other one was regarding the community garden. Um, and I was just hoping that the, it would be a partnership and sharing model instead of an ownership model, because an ownership model does not address food insecurity and accessibility to food. So I would hope that it would continue in the venue of growing food for people to come and eat. If you need a tomato, you take a tomato. And perhaps there's some of the garden that is intentional for groundwork to, to then sell at the mobile market. So those are my questions and, uh, and really good job. Thank you guys. Thanks, Tori. Great comments and questions as always. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the model for the community gardens is something that uh, will continue to uh, evolve. Um, and I'll, I'll refer to Luis if there's any already been discussion on that. Sorry, Rich, did you just hand over to me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there has been a lot of conversation on this. And while I respect Tori's opinion, there are also a number of people who have weighed in on this and do want individual plots. It's not an ownership model, but rather it's quite understandable that when people invest in a community garden and invest in their garden, they would prefer that folks are not able to come in and get whatever tomatoes they want. So uh, I think we're really open to considering all of these models, in a, additionally with the Groundwork Somerville. But we have in the past um, tried some different things and then had to go back and kind of retrofit. So uh, I think there's I think there is an opportunity for all of these models to be tried. But the overwhelming commentary that we've heard and what has come before is that folks are looking for actual community garden plots because we know that we have um, a lack of those. So we will keep those comments in mind uh, when designing that. Okay, I see another hand raised. Uh, David Fitcher, I will unmute you. Um, if I can figure out how to do that. Okay, I think you are unmuted. Um, yes, I'm um, an artist at Joy Street Studios, um, which is right across from this whole area. Um, you know, I'll start with my positive feedback, which is I like the fact that it's laid out on a diagonal and the kind of irregularity of that. It's not, it has a kind of a um, asymmetrical nature to it, which I think reflects what a lot of great art is about. Um, on the other hand, I feel like it's too clean and too, and I don't mean that in its trash, but um, it has little of the kind of funkiness that, for example, in the community garden, when you go to a, a real community garden that pre-exists, that's sort of put together, um, you see a lot of irregularity. Um, the way the uh, layout is in these perfect rectangles that are on a grid seems to me to not reflect the um, the kind of cultural um, funkiness that you usually see in a community garden, which I absolutely adore. Um, and then I'm not sure I understand the art barn. It seems like a big mass on the outside. I don't know what the materials of it are. And having grown up in the Midwest and look, you know, spent a lot of time around beautiful barns, I think you might want to revisit the colors um and the way windows are used in a in a in a real barn to kind of give it some some more character um so that would be my main thing and um i like the raised um area around the pump station where it kind of i think if i'm reading the the model right it looks like the it kind of goes up along the wall that that kind of irregularity i really like so I, I guess I would I would say there just needs to be more fun in it, more art, um, and maybe 
bringing in some of the artists that are in Brick Bottom and Joy Street to help with that or to talk about that and or to brainstorm about that um, might bring that kind of a little bit more um, playfulness and a little more uh, to because you're great. You have this great concept of a farm uh, and then it just needs to be taken to a, a, a further a further distance. I think that metaphor. Um, anyway, that's that's my feedback. <laughs> So thanks for holding this meeting, though. Thank you, David. Uh, I would like to hear Chris react to the Art Barn comments with some of the materials and uh, some of that feedback we're hearing. And then we can talk more about community gardens after that. Um, which Chris? <laughs> yes, Chris Prado. Sorry. No, his, yeah. OK. In my yeah, this this may be actually a better uh, question, answered better by the other Chris, but um, I, I would say before Chris answers is that this this rendering is a little bit misleading. It's not showing the materiality and the colours. If we go down to some of the eye levels, you'll see uh, closer to I think Chris Grimley's intent. Um, so I'll I'll hand it over to Chris Grimley. Yeah, I mean I I think that's that's an accurate reading here and. Um, you know, part of the the barn's identity has always been this two tone paint, which shifts colors as you as you walk around it. Um, it is not a barn per se. It is uh, it's it's a performance building, and therefore it, 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 the windows and apertures into it are are prescriptive. Um, there is a large uh, door, which we're not seeing on, on this side, that opens up to Festival Plaza. Um, so it, it is, a, it is in, in many ways, a functional building, but it's also, I think, got some playfulness, which um, some of the materialities, the end pieces are, are, are wood that reflect the kind of legacy of, of barns and barn raising. And then the um, shifting color paint is really where uh, we're trying to take an inanimate object and bring some life to it. I would just like to add that the focus of this meeting really was the Poplar Street Station and that you can find all the previous meetings because we've been working on both the building and the art farm site for the last four to five years on the website and can really get an understanding of how we got to this point. So we really intentionally didn't spend time talking about the building the building, as Chris uh, from Over Under is mentioning, was set up to accommodate theater space and art space. Uh, but if you just stepped in and are looking at the project now, you wouldn't know that. So I would recommend for folks to go uh, see the background in the art on the art farm pages, either on the Somerville Arts Council website or on the City of Somerville's uh, website, because there's a great deal of um, there are diagrams about how the people can interact both inside and out. There are dimensions on it all the technical stuff as well as more illustrative barn um, images. So I, I recommend that people go and have a look at that. A lot of work has come before uh, we get to this meeting, so. Yeah, and to un answer the question about the, uh, the community gardens, the, 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 the sort of the grid depicted in the, in the renderings was placeholder and our intent is to, is to meet with the, uh, the community and figure out exactly what that needs to be. And I, I personally love the idea of something more playful and something less regimented. So uh, we look forward to collaborating further on that. Hopefully I can jump in with a question here. Uh, I know a lot of folks, um, self-included, have been waiting uh, on this project for a very long time. One of the um, one of the pieces that people have been anticipating is having pieces of this site activated uh, as different phases happen, as the diff different phases get completed. It sounds now as if this is all going to be happening in one giant lump of construction. Uh, I was hoping we'd, we'd have a little bit more clarity in terms of timelines and whether or not this construction is going to be phased and, and when um, people could anticipate you know, clean up an activity on the site. Uh, it is it is a construction laydown zone right now, and it's been in that condition uh, pretty much since the transfer station went down. So, I mean, Director Rage, maybe 
you might be able to help out with that. Thank you, Councillor. That is an excellent segue into our next step slides. <laughs> so we'll we'll move right into that. And if there's you know any specificity we want to uh, provide after that, we'll happily do so. Okay, so obviously this leaves a lot of uh, ambiguity with next steps. So we wanted to lay out what we envision this process looking like uh, after this event. So we need to finish our preliminary design of the pump station. Um, there's gonna be some more field investigation, uh, utility agency co coordination, because there's a significant energy need for the pumps themselves and to get connectivity to the building structures. Um, Construction documents for the pump station and our farm need to be updated. Uh, we need to go through the current permitting uh, avenues. So that's outside agencies, such as um, the city departments themselves, the MBTA, which we are partnering with on this project to connect to their drainage, uh, MassDOT, MWRA. And outside of that, we have to figure out some property easements to correctly uh, leverage that MBTA pipe network. So we have to actually get to the pipe. So that necessitates some easements. And then the procurement of a construction contractor, that takes time as well. Um, so what the next steps are is really more of the community outreach process after we get that final design report, uh, the, excuse me, preliminary design report. And then that will initiate our final design process. Uh, and we will be reaching out actively to folks. And the hub for that is definitely gonna be the Summer Voice website. Uh, we're going to have written responses to the Q&A, uh, specifically if we missed anything. And we will be posting this presentation as well. There will be project announcements as things develop. Um, and specifically as we target a next community outreach event. And there will be an online survey that we're in development for. We will email blast that out to everyone so everyone will be aware of it and it will be accessible. And then that next community outreach event is gonna be this summer to present the findings of the preliminary design report. So with that, uh, we wanna thank you for participating. Uh, I realize that timeline, we probably should put a little bit more meat on that. So I, uh, I'm i gonna ask Rich to kind of fill in some gaps there. Uh, but for all other questions and comments, uh, this is the website to go to. We've put that in chat before. We can do that again. Uh, but that's the Summer Voice page. Uh, we we need to amend this URL. It should be Poplar Dash Art Farm at the end of this URL. So that's going to get you to the project page. And that's the end of the formal presentation. Yeah, just to you know, get to Councillor Scott's question in terms of. Um, you know, phased occupancy. Given the the um, amount of construction that needs to happen, um, the the phased occupancy is going to be difficult to actuate. I, mean, I think it's definitely something we're going to be looking at as as far as um, how, how to maintain the community gardens throughout uh, construction and where, where to put them, um, how to uh, um, activate more of the site in the interim. Um, we do have to do a little bit more work on that. Um, but it's definitely something that we understand is a priority um, of, of the site. I think we have a similar um, issue over at uh, 90 Washington, um, the public safety site, and, and there might be some opportunities to grab some real estate over there temporarily uh, with the way that development is, is moving forward. Um, but the, uh, we definitely owe um, you and the community a little bit more information on that uh, that we don't have quite at this at this moment other than to say um it, it's going to be difficult to, to have sort of a, a large-scale phase occupancy uh, of the site given the um the depth to which we need to dig the tank but uh otherwise jonathan says uh you know, thank you Thank you to everyone for um, all your interest in this. We had some tremendous out to, uh, um, attendance here. We were up over 60 people, um, a lot of great questions uh, in the question feature, a lot of uh, interesting back and forth, and I'm looking forward to continuing this, uh, this project.
think it's going to be very exciting for everyone. All right, with that, um, just as a closing remark, again, this presentation is recorded and will be uploaded to the Summer Voice website for the project. Um, and if anyone has any issues accessing that, uh, please reach out to the engineering department. That will get routed to me. And um, subsequently, my contact information is on the Summer Voice page as well. So thank you for the time. And that will wrap up our presentation.